Good morning. Hemshech, I am Bayes, volume three. We are on the top of page 1443. So let's sum up what we're discussing. In one word, it's Achdus Hashem. How we, in a world that on its own, can appear to be disconnected and even fragmented, can, learns to understand and, and experience a divine unity, our oneness with God, and how existence itself is all part of the divine unified reality. In the words of the Shema, Hashem Echad, Echad. But echa doesn't just mean about God, it also means about reality. That there's one reality, that the ches and the dalad, that defines existence, seven heavens and earth is eight ches, and the dalad, the four different directions, are all one with the aleph of alufa shalelem, of the master of the universe. Now we learned that length, hamayrich be'echad, that when we elongate, when we extend and elaborate on Echad, which is the contemplation from the bottom up, as he explained in Krishna, from the bottom up, to understand that all of existence comes from the word of God, which comes from God's thought, all the way to the highest levels of the divine, before the Simpson, that's Hamayrach Be'echad. Then there's the Hamshach also, as we learn, Krishna also is drawing down God's sovereignty into existence. Like he said on top of page 1442. Then began a discussion, which we're in the middle of, which is how all of existence is really the divine. Because the yesh is that it must have an ayin, the ayin al the divine other reality that creates it perpetually. And that tells us that there's a ena reich. There's an infinite distance, so it reveals to us the Einarech of godliness, and it also reveals to us the Einarech even of Eir. And that's what we're in the middle of now. Because Eir on its own, light, divine energy, expresses the divine. So there, it tells us there's a source, but it doesn't tell us of how what that source is like and how far and distant it is, removed from everything. The yesh does tell us that, as we learned on the previous page. The einoid and the einarech that the yesh teaches us. So we're not just learning about the unity of the divine, even on lower levels. We're learning that we're connected and actually revealing, ultimately, a reality called etzem, the atzimus, that's beyond everything. And that's being revealed through existence. Today, it's not revealed. When Mashiach comes, that will be revealed. And furthermore, as I just said, as he begins on the bottom of page 1442, it says, from the Hisav we also learn about Eir. That Eir, even though Eir on its own seemed, would seem to reflect its source, which is not infinitely apart, but from understanding that Atmos is not, is so apart from the Yesh, we also learn that he's also apart from the, from the, from Eir. So even though the Eir, once it's created, once it exists, it's similar to and reflects its source, but it's still infinitely distant from the source. Why? Because the source is not beget the Eir. God, it's not like the sun, which is a source of light. God is not, he, light comes from him, but he's not defined by being a source of light. And he gave the example, he says, Yuvenzeh, from the Eish Yisedi, that the Ram, Rambam and the Ramban talk about, that core element called fire. So we know it's not fire. There's no light. They call it dark, actually. So he explains it's not dark, as in dark, in, in contrast to light. It's dark, meaning it's above light. It's beyond revelation. That's the top of page 1443. That is, That is, That is, So there's two ways you could say something is dark. You could say it's dark and not light. For example, night. Night and day 
are two are two commensurate realities. By day, Lakota, what the Abraham says, Lakota Er Yaim, the Yikra Lakim the Er Yaim, he called Er Day, and Lachesha, Kara Laila, and darkness is, was night. But then there's a state that's not night and or not, not light nor dark, it's beyond revelation altogether. And that's what the Einarech, the infinite distance of existence, teaching us that Atmos is so beyond that he can create something so different than himself, so to speak, tells us that his relationship with Er is also Einarech, because he's not defined by Er. And I was going to explain what that means in more detail. So we're on top of page 1443. The second line, the third line, I'll just go over. He says, Umuva Mizeh, Lamaila, just like with the Eshi Seidi, we understand the Maila, Sha Atzmus, move the Legamri Mina Er. That Atzmus is completely removed from being Er. That doesn't mean that Atzmus can't choose to, extend, to express himself through Er and he expresses whatever he wants to express. But to say that Atmos and Ur are closer to each other than Atmos and Yesh is not correct. They're distant. And he's going to explain this now. So line three, top of page 1443. And um, the pages can be found at imbase.com. It says, Ulevad zeis sha Atmos eine rak bebchines moir. So how do we explain that God is beyond Atmos is beyond being Ayr. He says, besides the fact that Atmos is not just a Moir, the sun, as I mentioned, the Pasuk, it says, God created Shneema Erisak Dalim. He created two luminaries, the sun and the moon, and its purpose is to be a Moir. Lahoyer Allah to radiate and illuminate the earth. Can we say the same thing on Atmos? No. So the Vaj says that Atmos is not just being a Moir. He also can be a Moir. But that's not his identity. Much more than that. So that right away tells you that it's moved though and completely separate from Oir, beyond it. In Igam, Bezesh, who is Baruch B'chinus Moir, he's saying, furthermore, even when the divine, even when Atmos chooses to be a source of light, means chooses to express himself through light, how do you move the Legamu? So it's not just that he's beyond being a moir, even when he chooses to be a moir, he's, he's also completely moved from it. From, from, he's still completely removed. And the oir is infinitely distant, completely, absolutely distant, and apart from the etzem ha even as Atmos is already in the form of a moir. So let me explain. Use a simple example. We'll use an example from uh, um, a human example. When we say somebody is a brilliant teacher, okay, so he's, does that teacher, that being a teacher, does that define him? Or a brilliant artist, the example I use often, artist, does that define the person? Not necessarily. The person can have many other qualities and qualities that we're not even aware of. Like, he, like, for example, he's an excellent human being. He can be, he can be a Rebbe. The Rabbeim, were, some of them were great artists, great singers, great teachers, of course, but they're far more than just that. Okay, so that's the first thing. That he, but the fact is they're also a good teacher. That person who's completely beyond being a teacher, when he does teach, he's a very good teacher. So what he's saying is two things. That first of all, teaching is not his essential identity. He's beyond that. And even while he's teaching, he's still beyond the expression of what he's teaching. So even when he's manifesting in that form, he's still be'en arech. I'd give it a human example. So the artist is not defined by being an artist. And even when he's an artist, it's also, he remains above and beyond being an artist, even when he's doing it. That's the two points he's making here. Now, we talk about uh, Hashem, God, obviously all this is even more so, because it's not even human. I just gave even a human being, we could understand this type of uh, so-called havdola, a part of being beyond. Okay. Well, and that's why 
min eir on a yodim rak mitziyah samoyer. That's why from light, from divine light and divine expression, what we only know is the existence of a source. So when you see divine light manifesting in whatever form, let's say in, 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 in uh, the Matan Teda was the divine revelation or a revelation in our own personal lives, the life we receive from God. I'm not talking about the creation of the Yesh now. We're talking about a divine revelation. So it is a gilui. But what is it telling us about God? So he's saying it's only telling us about the existence of a Moed. But it's not telling us what type of etzem is it? Just as I said, an artist creates a beautiful piece of art. What does the art tell us about the artist? It tells us there's an artist because art can't create itself. It means there's some brilliant artist, there's some excellent great artist who created this piece of art. But can it tell you about the, the so it's the mitzvah of the artist. Can it tell you about the muhus, what he says, eichu ma? Muhus comes from the word ma. Muhus, mahu. What type of artist it is? Yes, it can tell you about the artist as he's in relation to the art. That he's this type of artist, that type of artist. But it cannot tell you um, what he is beyond that. So he's, meaning, the, the, the real essential personality, even of the moed, even of the artist, let alone of that which is b- b- the fact that he's being, that he's someone that's beyond being an artist altogether. In other words, the art expression of art is just a, a, a limited form of expression of the source. Somewhat like we spoke about that the artist can create infinite types of art. From one piece of art, you're not going to know of all those infinite types of art. You'll know one type of art. So when you look at the Esos Spheres, for example, even the highest level of the 10 hidden spheres, 10 attributes, what do you know? You know that God has these attributes. That's for sure, because they come from somewhere. Just like when someone does chesed to you, with you. Someone is kind to you, so you know they have kindness in them. But do you know the personality that sent what type of kindness? What it really is like? What, kind, what is the chesed of Asmus, so to speak? Just using that as an, a manner of expression, not that was just to, to make the point. And and what about the part of the etzem that's completely beyond chesed altogether? So that's essentially what he's saying. So it is a gili, but right now he's saying it's a gili of the mitzias of the etzem, not echomahu etzem. The koshkein. So that's even as the moed. The koshkein shlei neid miite muhusa etzem. And for sure, we don't know, like I just said, the muhus of the etzim itself. What's the difference in these two expressions? Because the first one he's saying is, you know there's a moir, but you don't know the personality of the moir. In other words, as a source of light. Now he's saying, what about the part that's completely beyond being a source of light as well? The etzim in general, for sure we don't know. So we don't, not, not only don't we know the muhus of the artist, we also don't know the muhus of the person Beyond being the artist. I'll soon stop if anybody has questions, because this is a very um, this is a very fundamental piece in general Chassidus when it talks about this, this uh, relationship between Etzem and Yesh and Oyer. I elaborated in previous classes on this, but let me just continue reading inside, then we'll, we'll discuss it further. In the parenthesis, he adds, So he's adding now a point that we discussed, but in, in the actual text, our, the Rebbe Rashab until now has told us the yes reveals that God is in Arech. Because to create yes, you need an ayin that's completely apart from the yes. As we learned that length, on the previous page. Now he's going to add more than that. That the Yesh actually teaches us something about the personality of the Etzem of, of Etzem that the Er does not teach. Not just that it's Ein Arech. Because Ein Arech doesn't tell us what it's like. It just tells us it's completely something else. So he's going to say, like it says elsewhere, Shanivroim Megalalani, Nivroim, meaning the Yesh, creation, revealed to us more of Muhusa Etzem Memasha Er Megala than what Er is Megala. Eir is Megala, like we said, God's majesty. 
God's brilliance, the example I gave from the Baal Shem Tov, the literate scholar who appreciates the wisdom and the art and the music of God, of the master, of the, of the king. So it is Megala a lot, but it's Megala the majesty, the Giluim of Elikus, like you just said, the Metzias of the Moir, and, and not the Mohus, and definitely not the Mohus of the Etzim itself. But Nevroim, on the other hand, are Megala more about the Mohusa Etzem than Eiriz Megala. Why? The Misavis on Uyedim, from Misavis we know, in addition to what we learned before, that the Ayin has to become, has to be a paradigm shift. Ur does not teach us that on its own. But with Misavis we know, Sha Etzem Mitsuyusim Atzmusei, that the Etzem is Mitsuyusim Atzmusei, it's an existence that comes from within himself, he's the source of every of his own existence in, in, in every in every everything that exists has a source except atmus how do we know it because since the yesh does not feel it has a source so from that he concludes that means it had to be created by something that has no source oyer can't tell us that oyer absolutely indicates there's a source light tells you there's a source of light Sunlight tells you there's a sun. Moonlight tells you there's a moon. Light, by definition, is a revealer of its source. A yes is the opposite. It's a concealer of its source. It says, I exist. We can contemplate and come to realize that there's a source. But if you look at the yes without any effort, it dictates, I created myself. Look how we feel. Even though we know we have parents, and even though we were given, we were given birth to, Nobody feels like a, a, an extension of your parent, like a branch of a tree. You understand it, and you appreciate it, and you respect it. But what does the yes declare? I'm here. Ani. In the worst scenario, ani me and nothing else. Total selfishness. But even if it's not selfish, the yes dictates, does not reveal a source. So he explains in the Geras HaKedish. And the Rebbe Rashab is now saying, okay, machir. he means the Geras HaKedish, but also there's my modem. In, 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 here is the Rebbe Rashab. I think the Mimer of Tofrei Samach Gimel. I have to look it up. The Friedrich Rebbe has it in the Mimer of Tiku and Matzuzu in Tofshin Zion. I believe that that's taken from the Rebbe Rashab. I have to look up the source. But so the first thing the Yesh tells us, it tells us something about the Mosa Etzem that the Ur can't tell us. Art, art can tell us there's an artist and can tell us something about the artist. But I can, they cannot tell you about the personality of the artist that art is not able to reveal. Art reveals there's an artist, but it can't tell you that the artist is Monsieur Simats Musse. How would we know that? The Yesh, because its personality is one of this type of independence, that it senses itself as its own, it reveals to us something of the Muhusa Etzem. So the Yesh can give us a taste of that. So in other words, when we feel completely self-contained, even though it can be the root of a lot of problems, but the very feeling is giving us somewhat about God's self-containment. Self-containment, meaning mitziyusei, his mitziyus is matzmusei from within himself. Every mitziyus comes from somewhere. God, who, when they say, who created God? If you understood anything about God, you can't ask that question. Because the creator is not just another entity. It's not like a tree and a seed. So the seed came from the tree, and the tree came from a previous seed and tree. With Atzmus, it's Mitzusim Atzmusi. His reality dictates his reality. A-S-A, I am because I am. Because he's real. Who gives us a little taste in that? When we feel that we are like so-called self-created, that's where it's coming from. And the second, the second thing we also know from the Yesh, from the Nvroim, Ushu Nimtza B'bchin is built to Mitzis Nimtza. That Atzmus exists in a form of non-existential existence, which means when we say something exists, what do we mean? In some way, it manifests. Whether it's through our sensory tools, empirically, I see it, I hear it, I taste, I touch, or smell it, or we sense it through intelligence and feeling, we intuit. In some way, existence, because it's present in some fashion, Mitzis built in Mitzis Nimtza means that God's existence is unlike any other existence because it doesn't manifest when you say it exists. 
it doesn't exist because it manifests in a certain way. So we call it non-existential existence. It's like saying it doesn't, you can't say it doesn't exist, God forbid. So you say it doesn't not exist. It's like similar when we say God has wisdom. So there's a level where God manifests in wisdom, in chachma, or chesed, kindness, in atzilus. But then there's a level, chakim v'leib chachmi yediyah. He knows, but not with knowable knowledge. And then there's a level where you say, you don't say God is wise. On the other hand, you can't say he doesn't have wisdom. So you say he does not not have wisdom. It's a form of extrapolation that helps us understand that God can be defined by it, but he's also not defined by not having it. So you say he has it, but in a completely different reality. This too cannot be revealed to us by Ur, because Ur is a mitzvah nimtza. Sunlight can teach us about the sun, but it can't teach us about something that it itself doesn't have. How does the Yesh Nivraim reveal built in Mitzvah Nimtza? So in these Maimodim, it's not this is not in the Geras Arkadish. In the Maimodim, in Tafshin Zayin, I'm referring to now, which I said, Rebbe Rashab is obviously not referring to Tafshin Zayin. This is uh, that came later. That's the Friedrich Rebbe's Maim, 1947. But in the the content, it speaks there because when you really con contemplate on the Yesh, like we learned earlier you realize it doesn't have any existence of its own. Because that doesn't have value of its own. Something had to put it there. So as a result, the existence is like a very negligible one. So he, comes, so he says, from that we learn that real Mitzvah of Atmos is also one that you can't say it, it, it exists. When you say something like emes or divine reality as a revelation, that's an existing reality. Mitzvah Nimtza, a true Mitzvah Nimtza. Physical reality is not a true Mitzvah Nimtza because it doesn't have anything to stand on its own feet. It doesn't have any emes to it. The only emes is because God created it. So Siddhis explains that reveals to us that there could be something that exists and it's not really called existence. So Lamaila, obviously, it's not due to its being negligible, God forbid, but it reveals to us that, so that it was created by something that is not defined by existence itself. By being. It's defined by being, but by, by something completely different. Milton Mitzias Nimtza. I'm only elaborating because he doesn't explain in the parentheses why. He just says, says that as a fact. The bottom line here, that's this, the emphasis here, however, is not on the reasoning behind it, it's just to make the statement that Uyr does not reveal the etzim, the muhusa etzim, I should say. And the parentheses just emphasizes even more so. How the Yesh, the Nevraim, reveal more of the Muhusa Etzem than does the than does Ur. But reveal, let's remember, Yesh doesn't reveal. It means it tells us. Because remember, till Lasid Lavi, we're not going to see it. But when you contemplate on the Yesh, you can discover aspects of Atmus that contemplating on Ur itself would not teach you. That's what he says here. So that's what he means by Megalim Lanu. Because under the Ur, Ur is a gili. Yesh is not a gili. But he means Megali means that it, uh, it teaches us about it. The emphasis is not so much on the gili. The emphasis is on letting us, being, making us aware. Okay. And then one more point, like he said. So this tells us that Ur is Be'en Reich from Atmos. Even Atmos as it manifests in being a moir, a source of Ur, of light. But also, another point he made earlier, if you recall, that it's not just enarech, the way it's created er, is also in the form of enarech. That's the next piece that he's going to say. You know what, I'm going to stop here for questions, then we'll talk about the way er is created. Because you could argue, er is infinitely distant. But once God creates it, he creates it, so to speak, in a close manner. Because it's revealing him. And he's going to explain, no, even the creation of er is also a paradigm shift, the manner of which Ur manifests. Well, let's uh, think it's wiser to stop right here and just review what we just learned and see if anybody wants any clarity on that. And then we'll learn about the second component here. Now, just one more key point to remember. Why is Ein Arech so critical here? Because if you remember, we spoke about unity. If you unite with the divine, you can unite with the divine that's commensurate to us. You could say God is the creator of existence. Like Shechina, Misla Beshes, and relates to us. 
Just one second, one second, please. Be back. Yes, you know, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, okay, sorry about that. Back to you, back to the class. So, when you say unite unity, like for example, let's go back to the example of artists and the art, you can make the argument. That since God is so beyond us, we cannot unite with the divine that's completely apart from us. So what do we unite with? The divine as it relates to us. Like when we say, We are human beings. We need to be sustained. We have food. God gave us the food. So we thank God. That's our relationship. God is coming down to our level, creation, and we thank God for that, which is a great achievement. Basically, a relationship with Mamala Kalam. Mamala Kalam means the divine as it relates to existence. And you can stop right there. The rest of the divine that's completely apart, you could argue, is off limits. However, I'm not going through the whole elaboration now. Siddhis insists and has many reasons to do so that the unity is not just with Mamala Kalam. And like Yehud Tata. And it's not just with Sev of Kalaman, which is transcendent, but still Sev of Kol Alman. It still relates somewhat to existence. It's all the way with Atmos that's completely beyond existence. So if you want to have true Achmos, Hashem Echad, a true relationship, a true unity with the highest levels, we need to relate to it. But at the same time, we don't relate to it. So that's why it's so important here to focus on the Ein Arech, because as I explained, the Ein Arech on one hand is teaching us how God is so far beyond, but it's teaching us that. That means we can have a relationship with it because we're aware of it now. And the Yesh actually teaches us this more than the Ur does even. Ur reveals to us about God's relationship with us as is revealed, meaning rel relevant, relative to us, relevant to, and commensurate to our level. Yes, is teaching us about an Ein Arech, and is teaching that Ur also is Ein Arech. So this isn't just a side point. It happens to be fundamental because we want a unity with the divine that's Ein Arech, not just with the divine that's Be'erech and relates to our existence. Not just with Shechinta, but also with Kuchabrichu. And to say Yichud Kuchabrichu v'Shechinta, that Kuchabrichu, which is the transcendent, all the way to the highest levels, like we learned, Shemoya Atzmi, all the way in the highest levels, is one with the Shechina as the Shechina manifests in existence. So, and as we learned earlier, more at length. So that's why it's so important to understand the Ein Arech aspect. So this is an interesting element that by, un, by, by appreciating it, that alone may creates a relationship. You know, if, if we only had the relationship with God as artist to the art, then we'd say, yes, God is completely beyond, but we don't talk about it. We don't relate to it. It's not relevant to us. What's relevant is how God interacts with us on our terms. But here, this is an interaction, even though it's an interaction by understanding how God is so infinitely apart. But that's exactly he created a yesh that teaches us about the muhusa etzem and teaches us also, therefore, how er is also infinitely distant. And that itself is a, if you want, you can call that a revelation if you like. Not a revelation as in gili gili, but it's a revelation as an awareness of a, a dimensions of the divine that God could have kept completely off limits and never let us know altogether. The mere fact that we say is also God is telling us, I'm telling you that I am to you and in Elam Hazah you can experience that. I just wanted to add this point. I've said it before, but I think it's critical to uh, reiterate. Okay, any questions now?
on what we learned so far. Yes, that relationship to the Be'ein Oroch, the Atzmus, Matthias built in Mininsa, that level, is, are we able to have a, a, a deep, intimate relationship with that, or is it simply on the way of an awareness? We're having a relationship with an awareness that there's that level, but we can't really have delve into it, so to speak. We can't really integrate it in any kind of full manner. Well, I would say the following. First of all, an awareness is also something, fine, but that's not just enough awareness. Um, because, because we can have long, long discussions and uh, Siddim who've learned these ideas have had such discussions at length in understanding Mitzvah Simatz Musay and built the Mitzvah Nimtza. So it's not just a superficial uh, awareness. You could delve into it, as you put it, in deeper and deeper ways. That's number one. However, with a big qualification that, remember, you're delving into something that is beyond us. It's not something that you can just um, empirically relate to. Like, for example, let's just use a simple language. People will ask the question, why can't I see God? Why does God not reveal himself to me? So when you look at this properly, you come to realize, even if you were to see God, it would not be the essence of God. It would be a manifestation, whether it's a miracle or some other revelation. Because the very essence of God defies expression. So the temptation is we want to have God on our terms. But that's why we always say that Hashem said to Moshe, no one can see me and live. If you want to see me, you have to look. You have to stop looking. It can't be on your terms. As the Gemara says, Hashem said to Moshe, when I wanted to show my face to you, you didn't want to look. Now when you want to see it, I'm not going to reveal myself because it's you. So you have to come to a point of bittle where you're ready to surrender and suspend as I point out many times when you read a book and you get so absorbed in it, as soon as you begin to be aware of your absorption, you're going to lose it. So essentially, you could experience these deeper levels of divine. But it takes a lot of training and a lot of time. Because what I just described, even appreciating Atsilus can take a lifetime. Because we understand, the most we understand about God, how, how many of us, how many years have we spent time they sit them their whole lives. That's what they did all day. So every work that we do helps us so-called acclimate ourselves and learn new higher states of awareness and higher states of consciousness that allow us to experience something beyond our own perception. And the more we, the higher we reach, the more we um, suspend ourselves, the more bittle there is, the more bittle there is, the more God can manifest. So these highest levels, to really be able to integrate it, you'd have to come to a point where you have completely reached total bittle by Metzius. But not bittle as annihilation. Bittle because you spent your whole life working on yourself. Like the student, in the beginning he study, he learns what the teacher teaches him on his terms. But our boy Shnin, when he turns 40 years later, so then he can reach the teacher's wisdom on the teacher's terms. And he can continue to grow. But that came only after 40 years. Why 40 years? Why can't it be right away? Because it takes all that training to um, so-called uh, remove all the blocks and all your own identity to allow the divine identity to manifest within you. That's very, very complex avoda. That does not happen easily. Because look, everybody here, I'm sure, is very divine and very pious and so on. But would you say that you do avoda Sashem completely lishma? Or there's ulterior motives? So don't feel bad if there are ulterior motives, because the, the, the Gemara and Kedushin and the Rambam cites in Halacha that says 
L'olam Adam Yasek B'teira Mitzvah Shalei L'shma B'teich L'shalei L'shma Ba L'shma The Rambam says clearly Everybody does Aveda For some ulterior motive It could be for a very blatant ulterior motive To make money To have covered To be respected by others To have influence It could be for more subtle reasons To have spiritual experience To have Olam Haba even the joy of serving God is also a, a motive. Only, he says, only Avram, only Avram kept committed to truth because it was true. Famous story with the Baal Shem Tev, where he was told that his Elam Haba will be lost and he became happy because he says, now I can serve God for no ulterior motive. So there's almost not non-existent an ulterior motive, which means there's always me. Somewhere there's a me. Yes, it could be uh, a Kedusha Dika me. could be doing it for Kedusha. It could be because it makes you feel good. But it's not complete suspension of self. I say complete. I'm not saying there's no suspension because me could also be very selfish where you don't help anybody. But like, for example, it's Dukkha. There's no problem to give Dukkha even if you're going to get the re reward. We're told even that God said, test me. That if a person gives Dukkha to save someone, save their child's life, it's not considered a problem. The bottom line is you helped somebody. My point is to reach a place where the you has become so refined that you're completely absorbed in the divine, what we call the highest levels of Ave B'tainugim, or even higher than that, then you begin to experience the highest levels of the divine. And I would say also Mitzusim Atzmusim and built the Limsa if you reach those levels. That's one point I want to make. The second point I want to make is he's saying here that the Yesh, the Nivra, teaches us about this. So when you, for example, see and feel, I should say, I feel that no one created me. Now, initially, that would sound like a negative. What do you mean no one created you? God created you. Is the root of all problems when we feel nobody created me. That was what the uh, Pare said. I have my river and I created myself. I'm a self a self made man. Comes the Alter Rebbe in a tremendous Chiddush in the last weeks of his life in this world when he wrote a Geras HaKedush 20, Simechov. He says, No, the mere fact that you feel that means because Atmos gave a piece of himself in us. Because Atmos is that way. So if a person can. Contemplate on that, how my sense of independence is really rooted in God's true independence. So you start getting a real taste of Mitzvah Matsmuse. I'll take it a step further. In the Sikha of Ayeshev Tovshin Nun Beis, it's a very classic, a very fundamental Sikha. I quote it very often. The Sikha where the Rebbe spoke about. France, the Alter Rebbe's opposition to France winning the war, but today we could transform France. So the Rebbe speaks there about the idea that the, what was the problem with France and the Western world? That's what they argued. We're self-made people. We don't, we're godless. It was a godless society. Everything was all the enlightenment and all the Benefits was because we humans achieved all of this. The Alter Rebbe saw that as a direct challenge to where the Jews were, that even though physically they maybe have more comfortable lives, but they would then suffer from this approach. The Rebbe said, ultimately, the goal is to transform it, not to avoid it. And he brings there an interesting thing. He says that the way... Shlichus was established that every place where Shliach goes in the world is not meant to be just an affiliate that's sending everybody back to New York. Every place, the Rebbe used the word every place should be a self-generating and initiating entity that should be a mocker for Torah and Mitzvahs. Because you could say like this, the, the main central headquarters is in Crown Heights in 770. You go out there to recruit people and send them all to New York. No. The goal is then each place should become a Mokum Tater. 
build a yeshiva there, build a shul, build a community, and it should be mitziyuse matzmuse. The Rebbe used that expression. So I would say the following, that when we use our faculties to become like shalhevas elame eleha, a flame that rises on its own, not just as a product of a teacher, that you're not just a makabal, but you become a mashpia of your own, you are experiencing mitsusi matsmusi of atmus in this world. In the higher spiritual world, that doesn't exist. Malochim don't have such a, can't have such an attitude. They know that they're all 24 7, they're ambassadors of God. The same thing, even the shamas in heaven. Definitely all the Eiris and Kalin of the Eilim Yisrael Yenin and Atzilus and all the way to the highest levels of Eir. Eir is telling you there's a source. It doesn't have Mitzvah Simat Smuse. It's only the Yesh, we in this world, a Yesh that can, yes, it could be misabused and we become self-made in the negative way, but the positive side of it is that we can reveal Atzmus here that when a person becomes so saturated and permeated with godliness, that they themselves exude the divine, not just as a channel and receiving from someone else like Er does, they are revealing the Mitzusi as Matzmusi of Atzmus. That's when the Rebbe says the words that the Yesh Anivra will be one with the Yesh Amiti. It's only the Yesh that can do that. So in that sense, I would say, it's not necessarily that we have to understand Mitzusi Matzmusi, but we can experience it. And we experience it that when you initiate, again, not just that you receive, and you know, like we speak, not just that you were ignited by someone else, but that you rise on your own, which means you, which was so central to the Rebbe's leadership, he kept insisting on that. You know, being that's Gimel Tamus today, I'm elaborating a bit more on this, because this is like the essence of it all. There would be no um, Chabad today had the Rebbe not implanted that power of Mitzvah Matzmuse within us. But we have to always remember, even when you initiate, that's also coming from the power from above. It's Atzmus that put into the Yesh that sense. So it's not independence in the sense that we're independent of God, but it means that we become so-called godly in our own right because we become creators in our own right. Meaning we initiate, we're not just channels and we're not just carriers, of someone else initiating. So in other words, it's not just that you're a Talmud, a student or a, Mosh, or a Makabal of the Rebbe, but you become an initiator in your own world, in your own environment. So that's, I would say, is the ultimate manifestation of Mitzusi Matzmuse. And after Gimel Tammuz, sadly, this becomes the only option right now. So that's how I would explain that piece. Any other questions, thoughts? So in other words, when you take your life and you take your faculties and skills and gifts and on your own volition, not because someone forced you. Mitsusi Matsmuse, at your own volition, you choose to align it with a higher purpose. You're bringing so called etzem in this world. Now we want the etzem begili. That's why you need Torah Mitzvahs, and that's why you need Ava Viyira, and you need all the revelations that Oyer provides. But it's only the Yesh that can do that, to make a Dira Betachtenim in that way, that this place becomes the Dira to Atzmus. Not Atzillus, not Gan Eden, not Elam Haba, this material world. The Yesh becomes a Keli, or a, you could say an expression of the Yesh Amiti through us when we do that type of thing. This is essentially what happens when the Shamas come down into bodies in this world. Not when the Shamas is above. The Shama above is one, is, feels its connection with its source. It's only down below where, we, uh, where it's concealed that allows the Yesh to manifest, basically the idea of free will. 
that you can choose the yesh, can choose to go the wrong way, or it can choose to align itself to the yesh amiti. And that's only something that this world can achieve, not in any of the higher worlds. That's somewhat translating this into Avedadik terms, more applied. Okay. And, and would, Rabbi, would you Is say... No... I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, would you say that that choice is the is the as is us acting as the at the the highest point that is our that's Hashem's gift to us that's the peace of Hashem that's within us. Yeah, it's part of it. The fact that we have that choice was given to us from that place because only God has t- total free will, and when we act on it, yes, we're accessing that part. But I would add to that, it's not just the free will, it's also our very being is, is such that can go in both directions. It could be total selfish narcissism. It's also the capable of a yesh, becoming a selfish narcissist. Or you take that self-generated um, effort and align it to uh, the, the higher purpose. So, in other words, are you, what you just said, which I thought was fascinating, by becoming a source ourselves, like a source, rather than an emanation, like or whatever, a source of, um, which is only from at etzim, is a source of thing. Becoming us, we choose to be a source of godliness on our own. That is enabling us to develop this a deepest level with the bein aroch. Is that yes. what you were yes. saying? Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's quite, so, quite, quite mind-blowing, yes. So, in a way, Gimel Thomas is is furthering that ability to do that, or by necessity, and we didn't want to. That's what I, I said before, it. exactly. Right. Correct? Yeah, because before Gimel oh, Thomas, the end of the day, you know, the Rebbe's glow and the Rebbe's aura and his whole presence was a big factor. Now that's not in a revealed way. So it comes down to, so to speak, well, this is like the real, uh, let's call it, this is like the real, this is, this is the real thing now, the real test. What are you going to do when you, so to speak, on your own? And we're never on our own, but it could appear that way, right? Look, if somebody's standing inside the Rebbe's room or an, or a Yechidus or Fabrengen and they're behaving and doing what the Rebbe wants, okay, they get some credit. It's nice. But imagine that they're doing the right thing even when they're not in the presence. They're somewhere where they can, that they in their minds can say, nobody's watching. I'm on my own, so to speak. Everything's concealed. Oyer does not have that luxury. Oyer is always in the presence of its moir. That's what's the whole purpose of Ur, is to reveal. So it's interesting. Yeah, that, that. You're talking about Eina Reich. The Rebbe once said an expression, we talked about shlichus, when people said they want to stay in New York, they want to stay close to the Rebbe. So the Rebbe once said, more than once, he said, Vos weiter, vos nenter. The farther you are, the closer you are. You get it? Because the farther you are, the more you're fulfilling the intention of, of the source. Okay. Let us, let me see here. The next section, I'll, I'll, I'll begin reading, unless anyone else wants to ask anything. I will tell you, again, this piece that we're learning now is one of the deepest pieces of Chassidus. And over the years, as I've learned it, I remember when I first was exposed to it, it takes years to really master, to be honest. And I don't say the word master is a strong word. Maybe let's strike that word. But it takes years to begin to really fully appreciate it. I mean that, years. It's not just an idea. It's, it's a whole way of, another way of looking at things. You know, because it's so, 
paradoxical in so many ways. That on one hand, we're talking about something that is, so to speak, on its own and doesn't reveal godliness. On the other hand, that can reveal the deepest level of God. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm sure you've heard this idea, maybe you've learned it already, but it is an idea that takes time to, every time I read it or learn it again, it always, it always goes back to that place to really, to get yourself into a very different mindset than the way we usually think about things. Because everything becomes like reverse, so to speak, but, but it's very, uh, very rich, very rich and very empowering when you really get to it, get down to it. I, I have a quick question. Is it okay if I ask a question? Sure. Um, and I apologize to you and the classmates if I've asked this before. It, maybe I have. I don't remember. So forgive me. Um, but it's it's raised by this section here. So if we, Nivraim, think of, we, we contemplate our yeshus, our, you know, our separateness, we feel independent, feel like, you know, uh, created on our, our own, or with, with, you know, we don't see God. So if we, we focus on that, therefore we, we understand that, that our source is that way. And that's how, that's what that very feeling, if developed properly, can lead us to have a closer relationship with, um, with Atzimus Samahus, in the ultimate the highest level of Elikus. So, but in order to really connect with that level, um, we have to be essentially, uh, we have to relate to God on God's terms, which means we have to sort of give up the self. We have to have such great bittal that, you know, call us an effish, uh, whatever the proper language is, we, we stop essentially feeling self. So you go from one extreme to the other, which makes sense, you know, that to get reach the highest level, you have to come from the lowest level. But still, it's not as much of a relationship per se um, it's not to say it shouldn't be aspired for. I know that that's the ultimate goal, but but once if you're moving in that direction, you stop losing this sense of self um, because and you, you uh, you're relating to God on God's terms. You're just sort of becoming one with Atmos. You're essentially manifesting your yechida. It's becoming more oh maybe revealed essentially, and so you. You sort of you meaning yourself ceases okay, in a sense. Yeah, I, I hear I hear the question. So when you think of it mathematically, yes, it sounds like that. But let me give an example. Okay, um, a teacher is teaching a student, a beginner student. You start with Olive Bay's A B C, and then you learn Ben Chamesh Lamikra verse, Mishnah Talmud, etc. The student continues to develop, expand their minds, and studying with a true master, the student is also learning not just knowledge, but methodology, right? How to think, not just what to think. The student is learning tools, how to answer a question, how to approach something. Now, let's fast forward 40 years later. The student has become a master of his own or her own and has so absorbed and so internalized the methodology of the teacher that has become his own. As a matter of fact, not only his own, very well that he may be even adding to it. He may even surpass his teacher. So would you call that loss of self? or a transformation of self. So you could say, you know what, if he never had a teacher, he would always been who he is, and he would never have to lose himself into surrendering the bittal, the absorption of a teacher's uh, skills. But we don't quite understand that he also would make quite, he'd be quite a primitive yesh then as well. So my point is, that the loss of self is not really a loss of self. It's redirecting a self that would have been untamed and undeveloped. And the teacher, in this case, godliness, and all the levels that we climb. And finally, when we reach that, yesh amiti become, yesh anivri becomes one with yesh amiti, our mitzusi matzmusi that we began with is now aligned with God's mitzusi matzmusi. 
yes, you've given up the inferior and mortal and limited sense of self for a true eternal and divine self. You become one with it. So I can... So when you, you, you master it and you become a master, you don't even need to go back to your teacher because you've learned the methodology. You don't see it, oh, I've become, I've lost my identity. Now I'm, the, I'm just an extension of my teacher. The contrary, your teacher's teaching you has so, so internalized that you've been transformed and yourself is exuding the teacher now, the etzim. That's how I would... Uh, Contextualize yes. Very helpful. Definitely a much richer, more meaningful spin on it than losing oneself. Well, there's a part of losing. There's a part of giving up. We all know that you have to give something up to get something, but you're not giving up your essential essence. You're giving up more, you know, your maybe your inclinations or temptations, but you're ultimately, bottom line is being absorbed by something greater than yourself and not losing yourself. It's elevating yourself, ultimately. Thank you. Rabbi Jacobson. And there are stages. Uh, there are stages of discipline. Listen, there is a thing called restraining yourself from temptations, iskafia. It's not like it's all whatever you like you do. You do have to give up a certain element. But at the end of the day, you realize, just like somebody who's studying music, you give up your leisure time, but you become a great musician in the process. So in that sense, it's giving, it's giving up. Like when many people say, I don't want to become, I don't want to feel accountable to God because I have to give up all my fun, all my, my desires and all my pleasures. The answer is, yeah, you're giving up the so-called inferior superficial pleasures for a far deeper one. But it's stages, like any discipline. Remember also that we don't jump from the yesh below into atzmus. You do have to go through asiya, yitzira, bria, atzilus, and all the levels. You see that all the time. He's never jumping. It's just that ultimately that's where we end up. But you need to have all the giluim as well because it's part of our integration. The student can't become the teacher, essentially the chushi amakabal, like the chushi arav, unless he goes through all the stages of study and work and all that comes with it. Like I always mention, b'chol avavcha, then b'chol nafshecha, and then b'chol ma'idecha. Okay, I think that was helpful. I have a, I have a, a, yes, another question, but a comment. Um, this actually explains, at least to me, why the mitzvahs are so critical that it's, it needs to be done with the actual physical body. And that's the true connection, the way we come to really, really connect with the asphalt, and that's why it's not in the world of ruchnius. And being a Yud Gimel, obviously, of one teaching that I remember that it always stuck to me, it was one of the proofs that Rebbe brought that Techiyan HaMetin has to take place is because it says that, you know, he, Rebbe says that the Neshamot, when they, after 220 years, they get the reward in, in Gan Eden. But the physical body, which enabled the Neshamot to actually do the actual mitzvot, they never got the reward. So for that reason alone, there have to be, there has to be a Techiyan HaMetin. So anyway, I think this was a great, great, Introduction to that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wants to say anything? Okay, so we just also connected it to Gimel Thomas. That's good. I just wanted to chime in that your your answer to Yitzhak's question about being in the zone. I've always often thought about that that you lose yourself. But you just tra- changed my whole understanding of it. You're not losing yourself, but you're transforming yourself into your ideal state, so to speak, which is a whole different way of looking at it. Absolutely. Shkoyach, but remember, Shkoyach, like, Yitzhak, we know. Asking that. But, 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 rem- yeah, but keep this in mind. Remember, there's a yesh, ayin yesh. There is stages where you are going to feel and actually happen that you will lose parts of yourself. I mean, but then you come to realize that you've lost that which you need. It's like if a seed grows into a tree, the seed is no longer going to be a seed. It has to deteriorate. See what I'm saying? So there is stages of bittle where it, it could even feel very uncomfortable because you are 
leave me your comfort zone to go to another reality. Um, that's why you have to keep that in mind as well. It's part of the process. The rites of passage. And remember, those that wanted it too much got burned. Not even Aviyu. Even Moshe, when he said, I want to see God's face, and God said, no one can see my face and live. You have to, you have to know how to... The maneuvering is not simple. Rabbi Akiva was the only one that went in peace, went, entered in peace, and exited in peace. B'Shalom. Nichlas B'Shalom, V'yotze B'Shalom. The other three great, great sages. So it's a, it's, a, it's a process. We'll talk about it more. Rotsay and Shuv, Rotsay and Shuv. Constant tension and resolution. And I'll just throw in one more word, vulnerability. Most of us don't like to be vulnerable. And when you feel vulnerable, you feel like you're naked. You feel like you're defenseless. The truth is, ultimately entering like the Holy of Holies and being, the closer you want to get to God, there has to be a very deep vulnerability and trust. And that's not easy in a world like ours where we are very uncomfortable with that. So there's a lot more to be said on this. So we'll stop here. Stop here by the, the end of the parentheses. The next step is going to talk about the Hisavas of Er. We'll stop by Mitzias Nimtza, built to Mitzias Nimtza, top of page 1443. And um, we'll continue. So tonight, as I posted, I'll be doing a Fabrengen here, also be streamed live. I think uh, Yitzchok posted the, the, the actual link. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, Please is, that going to be on, is that going to be on your YouTube channel? Um, uh, I'm not sure which YouTube channel they're using. I'm not sure. Look at the link on on the. It's definitely going to be on the link that's. I don't, in the I group don't have right what's. Now. I don't have WhatsApp. I'm not in a WhatsApp. I don't use WhatsApp. So I was just wondering. The link is the link is for YouTube. I mean, I, if you want. Um, Can you private message me in Zoom? It won't be streamed on you. On, on either way, yeah, it won't be it's streamed. It's okay. On. It's okay, Ravi. Uh, it's, uh, can you just message me that, please? I'll do it right now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll put it in the um, chat for everybody. Oh, one second before you. Oh, you're not going to kill the recording if you turn off the recording. Yeah, it's fine. No, I'm. St I'm just stopping the record. The, yeah. The the the, the, the streaming. What time is it tonight? Sorry. What just? I think it says. What did it say? Eight. I think eight. Yeah. Which location? Thank it's you. at the Colo, the Ramais. New York, 309 New York Avenue. Those that are here, please join. Um, they're doing the whole Suda there. And uh, and online, of course. We're also going to be posting. I did a few Fabringans. You know, I was in Pittsburgh yesterday. Uh, 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 two, when was it? What's, what's today? Well, Tuesday night, Pittsburgh. I did a few Fabrengans there, as well as Minneapolis. We'll soon post all these Fabrengans as well. Okay.